I just wanted to sort of first of all mention, um, of course, I'm, I'm talking about these two things, uh, airborne gravity gradiometry and, uh, and inversion modelling. And I wanted to say thank you very much, of course, to my co-authors, uh, Glenn Pears, Matt Boyd and Ross Cayley for their contribution to this research. Certainly would have been, wouldn't have been possible uh, without that. Um, as well as that, I've got a, uh, a range of different other acknowledgements. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these. Some of these people uh, had a big impact on the acquisition of this particular survey, and some of them were instrumental in, you know, during discussions about the interpretation phase um, and the 3D modelling. I did want to highlight two in particular. One was uh, Mirror Geoscience, um, Glenn Pears works for that organisation. I also wanted to pay tribute to Richard Lane. Uh, many of you will know Richard passed away earlier this year. He's been a very generous mentor of mine for a long time. So the survey that I'm talking about was acquired as part of an initiative uh, called the Victorian Gas Program. Uh, the Victorian Gas Program was an initiative that came out, that was run out of the Geological Survey of Victoria. It was focused on two different basins, the Otway Basin and the Gippsland Basin, and there's a whole range of different activities that were done, things like assessing onshore gas fields, thinking about groundwater resources, we did lots of um, community engagement activities, um, literature reviews, building 3D models, thinking about porosity and permeability measurements, we did air quality measurements, and uh, this graphic here is intended to represent, we even set up an office down uh, in Warrnambool, a GSV office down in Warrnambool. I'm not sure why it looks like a Roman building, but never mind. Um, but of course, the plane here is in intended to represent the survey that, that I was involved with. So the airborne survey um, covers this region. You can see outlined by that pink shape there and the orangey sort of brown colored box um, represents the model space that um, for, the, for the 3D model. So I wanted to talk a little bit first about um, the survey rationale, why we decided to acquire this particular survey. So what we're looking at here is a, is a gravity grid, that's the color behind there. Um, so I'm, I just wanted to mention a little bit about the pre-existing gravity data set. So obviously any new data set that we acquire has yep. to be better than what we've already got. So onshore, uh, the data is characterized by roughly one and a half kilometer um, spacing. Uh, and um, in, in some cases, the spacing is a bit wider than that. In some cases, it's a little bit better, but um, the big difference is offshore. Offshore, we have largely these ship track data sets. So you can see this MGD 77 survey in the blue lines, probably a little bit more difficult to see, but there are some green lines here, which represent the Sorel Basin survey. Um, <clears throat> the important part here is to, to, to realize that the um, that transition zone, the three nautical mile limit, which is Victoria's jurisdiction, this region is, uh, is very little gravity data at all. And part of the objective for this particular survey was to try to merge or, or understand that transition zone so that we could merge our understanding between the on and the offshore. Uh, thinking also about the seismic data, this uh, represents all of these, all these lines represent all of the uh, seismic data that was collected both in the on and offshore. And you look at this and you go, wow, there's a tremendous number of lines there. Um, there are two different issues here. One, again, the transition zone is very difficult to understand because it's hard to acquire seismic data in that transition zone. Um, but more than that, a lot of the seismic data is, uh, in some cases, they have it has a relatively short recording length, so we're not getting that information about the deep structure. Um, <clears throat> and we were hoping to be able to acquire a survey that would help with that uh, as well. And some of the surveys as well, some of the seismic surveys have a bit of an older vintage, um, and so it's very difficult to see some of the deeper structures in there. So the... Uh, this is uh, some, some parameters about the airborne survey. Uh, CGG Aviation, which are now called Excalibur Airborne Geophysics, um, were, they were contracted to do this particular survey. Um, they acquired over 31,000 uh, line kilometres over a region 16,000 kilometres squared. The survey was flown in late 2018 into early 2019. And uh, you can see all of the uh, the flight lines, these purple lines here, are 500 metre spaced. So for an airborne gravity gradiometry survey, especially a regional one, this is considered to be a relatively detailed survey. Um, and as you can see, the tie lines were 15 kilometre tie lines. I suppose the only other thing that's worth mentioning here is that the, uh, the data set was acquired at an elevation 
of 150 metres, and that was increased to 300 metres over townships and wind farms and that sort of thing. So <clears throat> the instrument, instrumentation on board the aircraft, obviously the gravity gradiometer, that's what this instrument here is, but we also acquired um, what we're calling s graph data. So this is conventional gravity. So we're co collecting gravity data in two different ways. The gravity gradiometer is collecting um, gra the gravity gradient, whereas the s graph is collecting conventional gravity. So if you put a gravity meter on the ground, you push a button and get a value back for gravity, that's exactly what you know, the sort of information that this is acquiring. So it's a little bit like a souped up land-based gravity meter that's put onto an aircraft. So two different types of gravity data, um, which I'll talk about why we did that in just a moment. Uh, we, collect, we acquired magnetic data as well. Uh, the laser scanner was really important. So the LIDAR data, which we needed to be able to do those detailed uh, terrain corrections. Um, radar altimeter, and we also had a lot of really boring GoPro video of the ground as the plane was flying around. So all that information is sitting on our server somewhere. The uh, platform for geophysical operation, uh, there were actually two planes that we used to acquire this survey. One was this plane here, which was a Cessna Grand Caravan. As you can see, this is a single engine aircraft. Um, and so that was only going to fly the onshore line. So these green lines you can see here. Um, that was mostly just for safety purposes. So the offshore lines needed to be flown with a twin engine aircraft. So you can see that's this aircraft, which is a twin otter. This, this aircraft flew all of the blue, blue lines that you can see here, including all of the, uh, the tie lines, because all of those tie lines had a, uh, an offshore component. <clears throat> so this is the, uh, the final data set, so the gravity gradiometry. Um, this is the GDD or GZZ if you prefer that terminology. Uh, in this case, terrain corrected with a density of 1.8 grams per centimetre cube. And you might be thinking, wow, that seems really low. And yeah, that surprised us as well, but it seemed to be the best density to use to be able to remove the effect of terrain in this particular case. Um, needless, but you know, regardless of that, we also delivered the uh, free air gravity data set um, a density of 1.8 and we also delivered the database as a 2.67 as well. So the S, <clears throat> the S graph data set, like I said, is a bit of like a gravity meter that's sitting on board the aircraft. This is the gravity meter that you can see here and this is the data set that that acquired but it's unfiltered. So this data therefore, um, as you can see, has a large impact of flight lines. That's normal, that's how it's all airborne gravity is likely to be until it actually gets filtered. Normally we, we filter this airborne gravity data set with uh, relatively shorter wavelengths, maybe three kilometres or something like that. In this case, we filter the data set with a 25 kilometre low pass filter. And I'm going to explain why we used a 25 kilometre low pass filter in just a second. The reason is because of the full spectrum um, Falcon product that we were acquiring. So this is a slide that I borrowed from Chris Van Golder. Um, who used it in 20, a conference in 2019 and it's been about for a little bit longer. Frank Van Can used it earlier than that. But what we're looking at is if we look at the x-axis here, you can see all of the wavelengths um, on the x-axis and it's plotted against the errors, which are plotted in, in milligals here. So the idea or the way that we interpret this graph is to sort of look at one particular instrument, so airborne gravity, for example. So the airborne gravity, um, if we look at this blue curve, the way we interpret this is go, okay, anything above the blue line, we can image using that particular instrument. So things like rifts or bedrock or deep sedimentary basin structure, that sort of thing. But you notice that as we're, the wavelengths increase, the airborne gravity errors reduce. Airborne gravity is very good at imaging the longer wavelengths. On the other hand, we look at the airborne gravity gradiometry and this purple line here, and you can see the, the things that are above that, things like anticlines and faults, shallow basement, things that are likely to have a relatively short wavelength work quite well with for airborne gravity gradiometry. And you notice that as the wavelengths inc increase, the, uh, the errors tend to increase as well. So airborne gravity gradiometry is very good at imaging the shorter wavelengths. So what we want is kind of the best of both worlds. We want to use the short wavelengths, sorry, we want to use airborne gravity grad gradiometry for the short wavelengths, and we want to use the, the airborne gravity for the longer wavelengths. And that is the whole point of the full spectrum Falcon. That's the idea behind it. <clears throat> 
So how do we actually do that? Well, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than just adding the two data sets together. We need what's called a matched filter pair. And we apply this matched filter to both the S-graph data and the Falcon data. But first of all, we need to make sure that the Falcon data actually is in a form that can be compared with the S-graph data or the conventional gravity. So the first thing we need to do is integrate that Falcon data set so that it is comparable. So once we've done that, we can apply a 25 kilometer high pass filter over the Falcon or the gravity gradiometry data. So that means that we're keeping just the short wavelengths for that Falcon data set. Uh, and similarly, we take the S-grav or the conventional gravity data set and we want a 25 kilometer low pass filter. So that means we're taking all of the longer wavelengths um, out of the S-grav data set. We join these two things together, we add them together to get the full spectrum Falcon, which is uh, those have those two data sets conform together. In this case, terrain corrected with a density of 1.8 grams per centimeter cube. So zooming into that image, you can see this is what it looks like. I think it looks pretty cool. There's lots of detail in there. There's lots of information that we can see. Um, and this is what Richard Lane would describe as the crown jewels of this particular survey, if you like, because it incorporates the short wavelengths from the Falcon with the long wavelengths from the s data dataset. I wanted to touch on this thing as well. This is a thing called the shape index. And Chris Van Golder pointed me to this, who works at um, CGG or Excalibur. And as you can see from this paper here, so it's been around for a little while, but the shape index just combines a few different um, of tensor components. So the GNN, GNE, and the GEE of the, the, the gravity gradiometry tensor matrix. <clears throat> and it combines that using a formula, which I'm not going to show today. You can look at that paper if you're interested. But this is what the result of that is. And what I liked about this particular um, filter, if you want to call it that, is that unlike a standard gravity gradiometry data set, which gives you, you know, some sort of elliptical anomaly and you might have a peak that runs through the middle, the shape index tends to sharpen up the boundaries of this. So at least to my eye, I can see a lot more geological structure in this particular version of the gravity gradiometry data set. So um, the reason why I'm talking about this is we tended to use the, uh, this, this shape index as along with uh, lots of other things as well, to try to inform or understand in a qualitative way what the geological structures were, what the distribution of these different geological structures were. And we use that information to feed into the quantitative modeling. So what do I mean by this quantitative modeling? Well, that could be divided up into forward or inversion modeling, for example. And to be able to do forward and inversion modeling, we can't use surfaces like this. We need to discretize our model. And what I mean by discretize the model is to convert it from these sort of surfaces into a, well, a discretized model. So like a 3D grid, which is a little bit like a giant Rubik's cube, if you like, which is made up of millions of different cells. And then we divide those cells into different regions which are intended to represent different rock types. So in this case we can look at sedimentary units in the Altway Basin. From here we can apply a density to each one of these things and that gives us a density distribution which we can then use to calculate the forward response or the calculated response of that theoretical model. And the cool thing about that is we can then compare the calculated response to the observed and we can go, okay, well, this fault, <coughs> excuse me, this fault needs to move this way. This thing, this structure is too deep. It needs to be raised close to the surface. We can make changes to that theoretical model in an effort to try to obtain a match between the observed response measured in the field and the calculated response of that theoretical model. So that's forward modeling, but we can also do inversion modeling, which involves giving that model and the, the observed data to an inversion algorithm. And the inversion algorithm can then make iterative changes to the, ge the, the, the basin horizons or whatever ge um, geological boundaries there are in the model um, and the densities. It can make changes to both of those things, again, in an effort to obtain a match between the observed and uh, the calculated response. And often the best approach is to use a combination of these two things. And that's what we did in this particular project. So this is a, an example of a completed model. And this was a model that was built um, by um, Mirror Geoscience and they used um, v VPMG and GoCAD for their model. And they're the same tools that we used in our project as well. So with these models, there's always going to be these three things, an observed, a calculated and a residual response. So if you look on the left, on the right hand side here, you can see this is the observed response. This is what was measured in the field by the aircraft or on land or whatever the case may be. 
And on the right hand side, you can see the calculated response. So this is the theoretical response of that, that computer model. And as you can see, these two things look really similar. That's the point, right? That's what we're going for is to, to have these two data sets to look similar. This is a completed model. So you expect to see them match reasonably well. The residual data set is just the difference between these two things. So the important thing about the residual is it's giving us a bit of an indication about what structures that exist in reality that we might not have accounted for in the theoretical model. I wanted to talk about this concept of superposition and I'm not talking about superposition into from a geological perspective, I'm talking about superposition of geophysical anomalies. The challenge with interpreting gravity or potential field data sets is that we're getting the response of everything, all of the rocks, all at once at the same time. And it's our job to try and sort of unpack that if you like, and try and figure out which geophysical anomalies are attributed to which geological structures. And maybe this is an oversimplification, but sometimes it's helpful to look at a simple example. But you can see this example here where we've got really simple sort of a basement um, type of geometry where which is dipping towards the left for want of a better description. Um, there's a granite that's sitting in there, which has got this sort of odd trapezoidal shape. And then there's a relatively dense sort of dike that's sitting in the middle. We're gonna end up with a, uh, a relatively sort of a gradient, a shallow gradient, which could be attributed to that basement or those dipping strata. We'd end up with a relatively low gravity signature associated with the granite because the granite has a relatively low density. And then we end up with a, a high sort of local peak, which is associated with a dike in the middle. <clears throat> and so when we add all of these things together, you can see how we end up with, this is the total observed response, which is the collective sort of response of all of these different things that we get at once. So it's our job to try to unpack that and figure out, like I say, which geophysical anomalies are attributed to which geological structures. And the reason why I'm sort of harping on about this a little bit is because this sort of idea embodies the process that I'm gonna talk about um, with the inversion modeling phase. What we're trying to do is identify some particular anomaly and figure out what it is, incorporate it into our 3D model, and then, uh, and then try and extract it out and then look at the residual again. So looking at our data set, there's lots to think about here. There's high amplitude anomalies, there's low amplitude anomalies, there's long wavelengths, there's short wavelengths. Where we start? Well, in our case, the first thing we thought was, well, let's start with what we actually know. We have a bunch of interpreted seismic uh, horizons um, from work that was done also part of the Victorian gas program. So first of all, we've got the uh, top of basement surface. Again, all of these are interpreted from seismic. Um, there's an top of Otway group, um, top of Sherbrooke group, top of Wang group, and then of course the topography or the bathymetry. Now, this seismic interpretation um, included lots of other horizons in this particular model, but I'm only picking on the main groups in this case. So we can take those surfaces and then build a discretized model in the way that I described earlier. And that's exactly what we're looking at here. You can see this is kind of like that massive discreti um, 3D you know, Rubik's cube thing I was talking about. Um, so like a 3D grid, which has got all of these different um, horizons divided up. And the first thing that you notice when you look at this, once we've attributed densities and, and created the calculated response or the forward model, the first thing you notice is, wow, that looks really different to the observed response. There's virtually no similarity there at all. Maybe you could say that on the northern margin, we've got some high amplitude anomalies in the observed, but gee, that's a bit of a stretch. So there's a lot of difference between the forward model and the observed here. And what that's telling us is that this sedimentary basin, so the sedimentary horizons and the top of basement in this case, is a long way from describing all of the geophysical anomalies that we can see in the observed data. There must be more going on um, in this region. And of course, you know, there's structures in the basement and whatever, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, it's probably not even worth talking about the residual in this case because it is so different, but it's worth mentioning here that the, uh, the split, so the, the, the spread on the residual is plus or minus 15 milligals. So there's a lot that we need to try and deal with here. But one of the things I wanted to point out is just like, well, okay, what do we do next? It's a bit odd when we look at the observed response that there's this relatively high amplitude response on the southwestern margin of that survey. And you look at it and you go, that's curious, why would that be there? 
everything we know about the Otway Basin, at least from the seismic interpretations, is that we have a relatively thickening sequence of sediments that continues to thicken towards the offshore, or at least that's what the seismic tends to suggest. So why would there be a relatively high amplitude gravity response on the southwestern margin? Well, for that, as you can see that it's relatively close to the edge of the airborne survey, we need to think a little bit more regionally. So I was able to get hold of this thing called the, uh, the DTU-15, which is a uh, satellite-derived free air gravity data set from uh, the Technical University of Denmark. And this data set revealed that you can see there's a peak anomaly that's interesting about this data set, which is quite close to that, western, that southwestern margin of our airborne survey. And that peak closely follows the continental shelf margin. <clears throat> and I thought about this and I thought, I think I've seen this thing before. And so when you zoom out a little bit further, you can see, so now we're looking at the airborne surveys here, and this is this part of southeastern Australia. You can see that anomaly um, constantly follows the, uh, the, the, um, the continental shelf margin. And it's a relatively known phenomenon. I mean, it, it, um, but I wasn't really sure about why it was there or what we could do about it. So what I ended up doing was I found a... Uh, Another, another, some, some other research that was done on the eastern margin of North America. And these guys, Grow et al, Grow and others, were looking at um, a range of different troughs on this eastern margin of North America. I'm just particularly looking at the Carolina um, trough that you can see here. And they built a series of um, potential field models and simplifying that a little bit, um, you can see what they were able to do was produce a potential field model, which included mantle, lower crust, upper crust, the sediments, and a water thickness is sitting on the top. And using this, they were able to replicate that peak, which was sitting at the, uh, you know, close to that um, continental shelf margin. So the reason why that high amplitude response is there is because of an offset between the positive anomaly associated with the shallowing moho and the negative anomaly associated with that seawater and the sediments. So the important observation here is to recognise that we didn't necessarily have to add a high uh, excess density or some excess mass into the, into the model to be able to explain that peak that we see on the margin, but we did need to include a mantle surface or sorry, a moho surface um, into, the, into the 3D model. <clears throat> so for that, of course, there are a couple of things that we needed. Um, one was we recognised that there was a regional influence on this. And so we needed to think about producing a regional scale model. So we built a new regional scale model and we used that satellite derived gravity data to help us build that. The regional model was relatively simple. It was made up of, of course, the mantle um, with, you know, characterised by the top of a moho surface, um, a, a basement thickness, sediments, and, and of course, water sitting on the top. And what we were able to do using VPMG was to incise a local scale model inside that regional scale model. And this helped us deal with that, um, that regional effect. But of course, we also needed a mantle surface, so, so or a moho surface. And there's a few of these around. Um, we used a combination of things, um, an Osmoho that was done by um, Kennett and others. And um, Des Fitzgerald used an airy isostatic pro approach, which is this surface you can see here to create a surface for the Moho. But more than that, we wanted to go a little bit further and sort of have a little bit of more of a look to tweak that surface. We were aware that there were some other um, some other data sets that could help us with this, specifically some deep crustal seismic um, sections that were acquired in 2009. This is the GA SD1 line, um, the Ararat line across here as well. There's also some data sets that were acquired in 2006. Each one of these data sets um, was able to image the top of the mantle or the moho surface at around about 33 kilometres. So we wanted to make sure that we, uh, we characterise the moho effectively and were constraining it using that. So as well as those surfaces further toward the north of the airborne survey, there were also some offshore 12 second regional lines which were helpful in characterising that shape of that moho surface as well. So just for context, you can see obviously the airborne survey in the middle, this is the local model, and this larger box outside you can see is the regional model. So all of these lines you can see through here, these represent interpretations that we made of that um, moho surface using those relatively deep um, regional lines. So what we did is we took um, the moho surfaces that we had from um, Des Fitzgerald, for example, or Fitzgerald and others, 
and uh, we tweaked it using these interpretations. So the first thing we did is we took, okay, let's take that Moho surface. And like I said, we wanted to set the onshore component to 33 kilometers. So it was consistent with those reflection seismic interpretations. And then we compared it with the satellite gravity data set. We wanted to make sure that when we, we compare it with that satellite the gravity data set, we, we weren't making changes that were too large. So we only let the geometry inversion run for five iterations. We did that to minimize large changes made to the MOHO. If we let it invert for too long, it would start to use you know, gravity observations to make changes to the MOHO surface, which would normally be attributed to um, very, you know, geological variations that exist within the basement. So this is the regional model out here. And in this case, I'm only showing the MOHO surface, but the regional model also had um, the basement sediment and the water, like I was mentioning before. So this is the result of that, uh, that regional model. So again, remember that we're modeling the, uh, the satellite derived gravity data set here. And this was really encouraging because once we had been able to build these surfaces and produce the calculated response, you can see this is the, the forward model or the calculated response of that theoretical model. And you compare that to the observed. And thankfully we were able to replicate that relatively high peak associated with the continental shelf margin. So that was encouraging. And we decided, okay, we'll keep this as our regional scale model. So, then we can incise the local model into that regional model. So there are two different changes with this particular example here. We're taking the local model and we're incising it in the regional model here. But otherwise, this local model is exactly the same as the previous one that I, that I mentioned, except for I'm also adding this mantle surface in here as well, or the top of the, the Moho surface in there as well. And the reason for that, of course, was to try to explain this high amplitude response in the Southwest. We look at the calculated response of this new model, which includes that mantle surface. And this, like I say, this was encouraging because we're starting to see um, a reasonably good replication of that high amplitude response in the calculated compared to the observed. The other cool thing about this is that if we look at the residual, it's starting to show up north-south trending anomalies in this residual data set. And if we look further north of the Otway Basin, where the, uh, the basement rocks are, we know that most of those rocks in the north are, uh, uh, have that north-south trend. A couple of examples of that, if we look at the aeromagnetic data set, we can look at these specific aeromagnetic anomalies. We know that these highly magnetic anomalies are attributed to the Truro volcanics and the hummock serpentinite, and these are co-located with this high amplitude gravity response we can see in our airborne survey. Um, and similarly, if we look in the central region of the survey, there are these anomalies here that were um, we're, we studied a lot during a, a, a different project called the Stavely project. And you can see a lot of these anomalies um, have been traced down towards the south. A colleague of mine, Phil Skladzian, has interpreted these things to extend underneath the Otway Basin already. So we already knew that some of these, these are um, rocks attributed to the, um, the Mount Stavely volcanic complex. We knew a lot of these things exist and under the Otway Basin already, but this work was able to um, help us extend that a little bit further as well. So the end result here is we're kind of going, okay, now looking at the residual, it's telling us that we're starting to see the response of the basement rocks. So we need to think about incorporating basement rocks into our 3D model. So let's think about dividing up the basement. The first thing that we did is went, okay, let's look at dividing it up into, into the major structural zones that we know to be um, to exist in, uh, in Western Victoria. So the first one is the Bamber Fault. It just clips the margin of the airborne survey, but it dips towards the north. We interpret the foot wall of the Bamber Fault to be um, Selwyn Block in this case. Um, on the western margin, again, the Avoca Fault doesn't actually enter into the model at all. But again, the Avoca Fault dips towards the west. And so the Bendigo Zone, which is in the foot wall of the Avoca Fault, tends to make it into that uh, model space a little bit. The Moiston Fault separates the grampian Staveley Zone from the Stall Zone. The Moiston Fault dips towards the east. Um, and, uh, and of course, between the Moiston Fault and the Avoca Fault, we're compartmentalizing the stall zone. And similarly, we have the Yarra Mildred Fault, which is on the margin of the Grampian Stavely Zone. And, uh, and that separates the Grampian Stavely Zone from the stall zone. So see, these are some of the major faults um, that, were, that have been modeled before. And there, some minor tweaks were made to these um, for this particular project. But more than this, we also have this uh, 2009 deep crustal seismic section, which I showed a little bit before. What we know from this, from interpretations made of this particular data set, 
is uh, this Apsley fault. And that was really important because we know um, from interpreting that um, regional seismic line, the Apsley fault together with the Aramilgip fault compartmentalizes the Glenelg River metamorphic complex. And there we know, and so the, the Glenelg River metamorphic complex was interpreted to be extended underneath the Otway Basin as well. Similarly, there's a thing called the Hummocks Fault. The Hummocks Fault has been interpreted by various different workers over the years, and we looked at a lot of those things, and we kept a lot of the interpretations made from some of those different workers. Um, but there were some tweaks that were made to the Hummocks Fault to um, improve the fit to the gravity data set. The cool thing about the Hummocks Fault is that it was able to image or to characterise the eastern margin of these magnetic anomalies that you can see through here. But what we didn't have was a fault that was going to describe the western margin of those magnetic anomalies and therefore the high amplitude gravity anomalies that we're particularly looking at. So we built a new fault that for now is just called the Hummocks Splay. And this is consistent with a lot of mapping that was done in the Glenelg um, in the Glenelg sheet. So that is the western side of uh, of the survey area. But thinking a little bit more about the east side, I mentioned before a Stavely project that, that we worked on um, for, for quite a while and, and interpretations that have been made about, so what we're looking at here in this, in this central zone is a range of uh, the discretized model for that Stavely project that we worked on. And each one of these things represents the Mount Stavely volcanic complex. So these are Mafic, Cambrian Mafic rocks, which were emplaced along a series of thrusts um, and that, like I said, they have already been interpreted to exist underneath the uh, Otway Basin, but we were able to use this particular project to extend these things a little bit further. So they were in place using these particular thrusts, the Bunawa East and West faults, the uh, Bunigal East and West faults, and the Stavely East and West faults, as well as the Karamut faults as well. So using all of those things, all of these faults became um, the different structures that we were used to divide up the basement um, to divide up the basement. The only other ones uh, that were included here were a bunch of granites that we inter interpreted as well. In the interest of time, I'm not talking about the granites today. But like I was saying, we can use all of these different fault surfaces to create a new discretized model. So the new discretized model has granites in it. It has the mantle surface, the Selwyn block, which is of course the foot wall of the Bambra fault, the, um, the Bendigo zone, which is the foot wall of the Avoca fault. And then there's the stall zone. And in the Grampian Stavely zone, we have a, re a series of packages of rocks, the Canman II group, and then that Mount Stavely volcanic complex, the Stavely belt, Karamut belt, the Bunigal and the Bunawa belt. And these are kind of sandwiched between um, the Nargoon group and the, uh, and the Yarra Mildred fault, which dips towards the west. As well as that, further towards the west, there's a Glenelg River, Glenelg River metamorphic complex, and that was divided into two different components. And then on the uh, other side of that, the hummocks and the true row volcanics. And this was required to explain that high amplitude gravity anomaly that we see in that western side. Um, on the extreme west, we lumped a lot of these rocks together as Gawler equivalents. And then of course, um, importantly, there's also the sedimentary horizons. So the Otway group, the Sherbrooke, the Wangarip, anything after the Wangarip, which I've just called post Wangarip in this particular case, and the water thickness that sits on top. So this became the new discretized model and we can attrib attribute densities to all of these different units and calculate the forward response. Now I haven't really talked too much about densities, but, and I've included this table that you can see here. I don't expect anyone to look at this table. It's obviously pretty small, but I just wanted to point out that we did think about densities quite a lot. And uh, every single one of these geophysical domains that you can see in this 3D model Model had, except for with the only one or two exceptions, had a density associated with a measured density um, attributed to it. But what was interesting about this is once we calculated the forward model of that, we were able to compare it to the observed and you can see now it's starting to look a lot more like the observed response. Sure, there are a few different changes here and we can see those changes when we look at the residual data set. So, but what was good about this is we looked at this and we said, okay, well, it looks like we're looking at this residual data set, we've been able to remove a lot of those north-south uh, trending you know, anomalies that we think were attributed to rocks that reside within the basement. So zooming in a little bit to that residual data set and casting a bit of a sun angle on it so we can see some of the structures, we start to recognise a lot of east-west trends in this data set. And we attributed, well, we interpreted a lot of these east-west trends to be extensional structures associated with 
the Otway Basin or with this extension of the Otway Basin, which weren't originally captured um, with the original seismic interpretation. And that's why we went back to the seismic and had a bit more of a look at it and went, where are we actually really confident about the seismic interpretation? Where is it that we're actually pretty confident about the top of basement, particularly surface for, um, uh, for you know, the top of basement for the Otway Basin? And that's what we're looking at here. A lot of these black lines represent the seismic data sets um, where we're actually pretty confident about the interpretation made for the top of basement. And there's a lot of other seismic lines that we weren't so confident about. And typically those were existed further towards the south. And so we tended to kick those out if we weren't confident about it. Let's give the gravity a crack at trying to resolve the geometries um, to try to obtain a match between the calculated response and the observed. So the next step was to let, like I say, let the gravity invert for the model. So what we did is we took the 3D model and we locked all of the horizons in the entire 3D model, just with the exception of that top of basement surface, which is what this green surface is you can see here. So all of them are locked during the geometry inversion, except this one. But more than that, we wanted to make sure that we were also locking that top of basement surface where we had confidence in those seismic, um, from seismic interpretations. And that's what all these red points are here. These are places where we were pretty confident about the, uh, the depth to that um, top of basement from seismic. So we wanted to make sure that the surface wasn't moving where we had that confidence. And similarly, we had all of these yellow points here. You can see all of those yellow dots represent um, drilling intersections. Obviously, we wanted to make sure that we weren't um, moving away from those as well. So this is the result of that. You can see this is the uh, inverted surface, the refined top of basement surface. Um, for that 3D model. So of, of course, this thing exists inside this discretized model, but you can't see any changes. That's why the discretized model looks exactly the same as it did before. But the important part here is when we look at the calculated response, it's starting to look very, very similar to the observed. We can't see very many changes at all. The residual looks like there's lots of differences here, but it's important to remember here that the residual is now only spread over plus or minus two milligals, whereas before it was in the very start, first starting model, it was plus or minus 15. So if we were to look at this on the same scale as the, the, the residual for the starting model, this would be completely green uh, or in the middle, zero. You wouldn't see any variation at all. So I've redistributed the colors for the purposes of seeing those variations. Um, but again, zooming into that residual data set, we can see um, and casting another sun angle on this, we're starting to sort of see a lot more of a sort of a noisy appearance with this particular data set. And this became quite encouraging. A lot of the structures that we were seeing before in the resi residual data set, we felt that we weren't really, um, well, we felt like we were starting to explain a lot of those data, those those residual anomalies that we saw before. So I would suggest that a lot of the, the very, a lot of what's left over in this case could be attributed to things like density variability, which might exist within the, uh, the sedimentary units, or it could indeed be within the basement services. Um, structures that haven't been modelled, we know that there's a lot of um, volcanic rocks um, or volcanoes indeed that are scattered throughout this region, and uh, they haven't been modelled in this particular um, case. Certainly, if I was doing a, a, a local scale model, I'd be looking to include things like volcanoes in that data set. Um, and potentially granites that haven't been interpreted. It's very hard to identify granites. Um, but for a regional scale model, we felt that we had reached a point where we had explained the majority of these, um, those, those uh, regional geological structures. The last thing I wanted to do was point to a thing called uh, the Portland Trough. And the reason why I wanted to talk about this was specifically because if we look at this map here, this is a map of the geometry changes for that top of basement um, that were made through during that geometry inversion. So what we're looking at is places like we're trying to figure out where the largest changes were made to that top of basement surface during the geometry inversion. And as you can see, by far the most significant, significant change was associated, well, was in this southwest corner. And we know that that was associated with um, the Portland Trough because we've got, you know, the Portland Trough has been known for a long time, but we've also interpreted that Portland Trough, um, and there's a few different interpretations. This one comes from, um, from colleagues of mine in the Geological Survey, Alex, Louise and Rami interpreted, interpreted this, um, in this extent of that Portland Trough. So 
this whole workflow, um, which involved, you know, inversion and try and forward modeling and trying to understand the, uh, the crustal architecture of um, this part of the world, the geometry inversion amongst many other things suggests that this Portland trough is potentially a lot deeper than we previously thought and therefore potentially um, more perspective for things like um, conventional gas or for water resources or for geothermal or whatever it is that you want to do with the pore space. Um, that was pretty much everything that I wanted to talk about today. Um, the last thing I was just sort of mentioning here that if you were interested in here, learning more about any other work that was done, whether it be the, um, the full spectrum Falcon survey or thinking about quantitative interpretation, um, these two reports are sitting on GSV's um, online store. Thank you very much for your time.